my pleasure this evening to invite you to come and visit us and also to introduce you to the venerables that are here with me. Um, our teacher is Most Venerable Bhante Vimala Ramsey. His Mahatera means that he's an over 20 year monk. He um, originally, I'm, I'm going to introduce briefly also, uh, Venerable Kusla Nanda, and he is from Kuslayana, and he is from Sri Lanka, and he has taught at the University of Peridinia and at, uh, I think he taught some at Colombo too, right? Down in Colombo, and also in, in, in Sri Lanka this is, and also at the uh, Sri Lankan uh, International Buddhist <coughs> Academy that's up near Kandy. It's in a place called Palakeli. We are a meditation center, concentrating principally on that. And Bhante Vimala Ramsey, we call him uh, Bhante, and you may also refer to him as Bhante V or Bhante. Um, and he is the person who is going to be giving a talk to you tonight. And um, he actually has about 39 years experience in his meditation practice. He started back in 1974. He was born in New York. He lived for a time in Chicago, and then after 12 years old, he grew up in California in Escondido. And then he went over uh, later, and uh, he went to Asia and spent uh, about 12 and a half years over so there. So Bhatsi's going to be talking to you tonight about um, a, a subject that we were asked to talk about, which is basically a discussion uh, about the difference between um, rebirth and reincarnation, which are not the same thing. And we hope that you will join in, in questions and answers and have a discussion with us um, after he finishes the initial talk. It's a real interesting discussion because Tibetans very strongly believe in reincarnation. And they have the Dalai Lama, and it, when he dies, then the next one, and they have to go out and look for him and give him tests and that sort of thing. And they claim that he's, he's the reincarnation of the last Dalai Lama. Actually, that is coming from the Brahmin Hindu tradition. It's not Buddhist at all. Reincarnation is talking about having a permanent soul or self that gets reborn every time, over and over and over again. So they're talking about having a permanent kind of arrangement where you never die. Rebirth, on the other hand, is somewhat different. And when you start to learn about meditation, you start to see that everything is in a state of change. It's flux. It's always arising, passing away, arising, passing away of everything. And <clears throat> rebirth is birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, that is continually happening. Now, I teach meditation, and I teach people how to eventually see that consciousness is not just one thing. Consciousness arises and passes away very quickly. Now, when you're practicing uh, meditation, what will happen is you at first have this very strong belief in a personal self. This is my feeling. These are my thoughts. As you practice with meditation, the little brochure that you got that's three folds is the instruction in how to exactly practice this practice. 
you first recognize that your mind gets distracted once you're sitting in meditation. Then you release that distraction. You don't keep your attention on it. Next, you relax the tightness caused by that. Now you bring up something wholesome and you smile. And this is an important part of the meditation. And then you return to your object of meditation and stay with your object of meditation as long as you can. We call that the six R's. Now, when you start to get a little bit deeper and you start to become more familiar with how your mind's attention moves and you can let it be and relax and smile and come back to your object of meditation, you're actually starting to become more familiar with the process of consciousnesses arising and passing away. You start to see that, one, you have no control over what consciousness arises. Now, in in Buddhism, there are what we call six sense doors. The eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, and mind. In order to see, you have to have a good working eye. It has to hit color and form. When the good working eye hits color and form, eye consciousness arises. Okay? And that happens with the ear and sound, the, the nose and odor, the tongue and flavor, like that. Now these are individual consciousness, the consciousnesses that arise. You don't have one continuous consciousness. Like right now, you're hearing and you're seeing me at the same time, it seems. But there is a rising and passing away of both of these things that's happening very quickly. That was about a hundred thousand arising and passing away of the ear consciousness. So you can see that this is happening very fast. When you practice meditation, you actually can become so clear and aware in your mind that you will see individual consciousnesses arise and pass away. Birth, death, birth, death, birth, death. The reincarnation is the idea that you are continually having the same consciousness run and wander through the rounds of rebirth. And the reason consciousnesses arise is because of your good or bad actions. And that, again, is a Hindu idea. With rebirth, you're seeing the birth and death of consciousnesses arising and passing away very quickly. There is a continuum that happens and that becomes, that, that is caused by your past actions in other lifetimes even. Now, when you are sitting in meditation and you feel like moving, what is, what is the cause of that? Did you bring up that feeling or that thought and say, well, I haven't moved for a while, I should be moving? Or if you're sitting and you have a pain arise, did you ask that pain to come up? 
Nobody's going to do that to themselves. It arises because conditions are right for it to arise. Now what I'm talking about is karma. And this is a lot different way of looking at karma than you probably normally hear. Because of past action, this arises in the present moment. What you do with what arises in the present moment dictates what happens in the future. That's karma. <clears throat> so, when you start practicing meditation and you start seeing how mind's attention moves from one thing to another, to another, to another, and you start relaxing and letting that be and letting it go and not trying to make your mind become concentrated, but you allow your mind to become uh, collected. As you do that more and more, you start to see everything is impermanent. Everything is in a state of change. Sit still. Can you? Well, the earth is moving around. Can't sit still this way. You have molecules and atoms going all through your body, moving around and things moving around them. It's impossible to sit still. Everything in the universe is in a constant flux. It's in a constant stage of change. The only thing that's permanent is impermanence. Because of this, you start to see for yourself that there is an arising and passing away of phenomena continually over and over and over again. It's not the same. It's individual consciousnesses arising and passing away. Now when I, when I teach meditation, uh, I generally ask people to come at the, to the center for about two weeks of practice. After the first week, they generally, like 80% of the people that come, they will start to see individual consciousnesses arise and pass away. And you see that for yourself and you start knowing that this is not a philosophy like reincarnation is, but this is actually seeing the things that as they actually work. And the more clearly you see these things arising and passing away, the more you start to realize that everything is like a, we're in a holographic universe. There is an observer, there is a, something that cognizes. What do you cognize? What's happening in the present moment? What's happening in the present moment is continual arising and passing away of phenomena. It gets real interesting when you start practicing meditation because you don't have to believe anything that's said. All you have to do is practice and you'll see it for yourself. Now the thing with karma is pretty amazing. A lot of people, they, they really get caught up in 
oh, I, that's happening to me because my karma is bad or good or whatever. You have things that you have done in the past that are good, and you have done some things in the past that are not so good. And when the conditions are right for that karma to arise, it will arise by itself. And what you do with that in the present moment, if it's anger, if it's frustration, if it's some kind of attachment that you're holding on to, it can be emotional attachment, it can be physical attachment, whatever. If you take that personally and you say, this is my feeling, this is my thoughts, this is my sensation, this is who I am, you're not seeing things very clearly. Now, when I just talked to you about using the six R's, there's a step in there that's called relax. What does that mean? The relax step is the way that you see and recognize craving when it arises in your mind and in your body. Now the Buddha talked about Four Noble Truths. There is suffering in life. There is a cause of suffering, craving. There is a cessation of suffering. There's a way to let go of that suffering. So when you are learning how to practice meditation, you sit very calmly, very relaxed way, you close your eyes, and what I teach is called loving kindness meditation, where you wish happiness for yourself and other beings. And then your mind starts to go like this and get tight, and then all of a sudden you have thoughts arising and that turns into opinions and concepts and ideas and stories about why that feeling and why that craving arose. And right after that is where your emotional habitual tendency arises. Now you're made up of five different things. You have a physical body, there is feeling. Feeling is not emotion. Feeling is pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant. It's just a feeling. It's a nice feeling. It's not a nice feeling. It's kind of neutral. Then you have perception. Perception is a part of your mind that names things. Now you look at this and the part of your mind that said this is a book, that's perception. It also has memory in it. You have thoughts, you have consciousness. You're made up of these five things. Everybody is. Now when a painful feeling arises, it doesn't matter whether it's a physical painful feeling or a mental, emotional painful feeling. The first thing that we try to do is control that feeling with our thoughts. But thoughts are one thing and feelings are something else. The more you try to think the feeling the more intense and bigger that feeling becomes. Hmm? And this is our habitual tendency. This is what we get caught in doing over and over and over again, is we try to think our feeling away. We try to control our feeling 
with our thoughts and that just causes suffering to arise. And when you do that, when you try to control your, thought, your, your feelings with your thoughts, you're taking it personally. You're saying, this is my feeling and I don't like it and I want it to stop and I'm depressed and I don't like it or I'm angry and I don't like it. You're th trying to think your feeling. So how do you overcome that problem? By recognizing that there's tension and tightness in your head, in your mind. See that you're thinking about a feeling and let those thoughts go. What do I mean by let them go? Don't keep your attention on the thoughts anymore. Then you relax the tension and tightness caused in your head, in your mind. Now there is a membrane that goes around your brain. It's called the meninges. <clears throat> every time you have a thought, every time a feeling arises, every time a sensation arises, it causes tension and tightness around your brain. That tension and tightness is craving. Craving always manifests as I like it if it's a pleasant feeling, I don't like it if it's a painful feeling. And that is the very start of your identification with this thought or feeling. This is where you start saying, this is me, this is mine, this is who I am. But the truth is, you didn't ask this stuff to come up, it came up by itself. You can't control it while it's there, and you can't make it go away when you want it to go away. So it's not yours. It's just a feeling. And the more you learn how to relax that tension and tightness in your head, and feel that openness that happens when you let go of that tension and tightness, you'll notice right after you do that, there is no thoughts. Your mind is clear, your mind is very alert, your mind is very bright, and your mind is pure. Why is it pure? because you have let go of craving. Craving is the cause of suffering. Nobody wants to suffer. So how do you let go of it? First, you recognize that it's there. And don't keep your attention on it. If you keep your attention on your thoughts to try to control your feelings, you are going to suffer immeasurably more. And the more you try to control your thoughts with, or your feeling with your thoughts, the more intense that feeling becomes until you start getting frustrated, you get angry, you get uh, depressed, and then you say to everybody else around you, leave me alone, I'm depressed, don't bother me. Now I can tell you exactly, precisely exactly, how depression arises. And it's pretty simple. Painful feeling arises. I don't like that painful feeling. That's the craving. I have my opinions and thoughts and ideas and story about why I don't like that. 
Have you ever noticed when you get upset, you have a lot of repeat thoughts? And it's just like it was on a tape deck. Same thoughts, same order, over and over and over again. That says you have craving in your mind at that time. Right after this story about, then you get into your habitual tendency. Every time this kind of feeling comes up, I have these kind of thoughts and I try to control my feeling with my thoughts. And the feeling gets bigger and more intense. And you suffer. Why are you suffering? A couple of reasons. One, you're taking it personally. Whose thought is that? Whose feeling is that? Did you ask it to come up? Did you tell yourself, you know, I haven't been depressed for a long time, I might as well get depressed right now. It doesn't happen that way. It happens because of past actions. And what you did with that when it arose. Like most people, you try to think you're feeling a way. It doesn't work, but you keep trying to do it, thinking that there's going to be a different end result. But there's not. You just get more and more depressed. And then you say, oh, I got to go to the doctor and I got to talk to him about this and he's going to give me some drugs. That's not going to help. Learning how this process works, works 100% of the time. Becoming more aware of how your mind works, how you see the arising and passing away of these phenomena, this birth, death, birth, death, birth, death. This is rebirth. So when you become more familiar of how this process works, you're able to see that when you let go of the craving and you let go of that tightness in your head, in your mind, your mind becomes clear. And that leads to real, true happiness and contentment. <clears throat> the, the thing with what you did in the past dictates what happens in the future or what happens in the present and that dictates what happens in the future. If you resist, if you fight with, if you try to control, you can look forward to this kind of painful thing coming up over and over and over again. And it's your choice. You can allow that to happen or not. If you see in the present moment that you have frustration, anger, anxiety, depression, fear, whatever the catch of the day is, and you start to allow it to be and relax and smile and wish somebody happiness, you are changing in a positive way. The, th the whole point with Buddhism is learning how to allow these changes to happen in a positive way. And as you become more and more aware of how you cause yourself suffering and you let go of that suffering, you become more content with all of life. Everything in life becomes easier. It's pretty amazing to watch sometimes. Now, when, <clears throat> when you begin practicing meditation, we have you Practice your five precepts. 
What are the five precepts? The precepts are not commandments. They're suggestions that if you follow these five things, life will become easier. Don't kill or harm living beings on purpose. Don't take anything that's not given. Don't steal. Don't have any wrong sexual activity. Wrong sexual activity means sexual activity with someone that's too young, still under the care of their parents, or someone that's married. Not to tell lies even little white lies. Not to curse. Not to pit one group of people against another. Not to gossip. And what is gossip? It's talking about somebody that's not there and you're making up stories about them that aren't necessarily true. And don't take any drugs or alcohol that dull your mind. Now these five precepts, if you keep them, you will start to notice that your mind becomes real clear and bright and it's easy to meditate. <clears throat> when you break a precept, you will notice that your meditation doesn't work so well because you have hindrances that arise. Now when I say meditation, I'm not talking just about sitting. I'm talking about uh, all different aspects of your life. Because meditation is not just about sitting like a like like a stone Buddha image. It is about living and being aware of what you're doing in, with your mind in the present moment. So when you begin to practice the meditation the way that I suggest, <clears throat> you first start out by learning how to smile. And that sounds really odd. But you smile with your mind. You smile with your eyes. A little smile on your lips, a smile in your heart. Carry it with you wherever you're going. Send that smile to someone else. Send that happy feeling to someone else. And the more you keep practicing this without breaking the precepts, the faster your progress in the meditation becomes. It's pretty amazing. When I first started doing the meditation way back when, it took a long time to figure out what the meditation was before I found out what it wasn't. But as I started to realize more and more of what the Buddha was actually trying to teach us, uh, it doesn't take very long for you to understand, yeah, this is good, this works, and it's right. When I was practicing in Burma, they said, well, you have to do a few three-month retreats. A uh, three-month retreat in Burma is you get up at three o'clock in the morning and you do your sitting meditation and walking meditation alternately until 11 o'clock at night. And then you go to bed and get up at 3 o'clock and start all over again. Try that for three months sometimes. <coughs> I did it for eight. 
So it's a pretty, uh, it's pretty intense. But I've since learned that there are other ways of doing the meditation that are much easier and it's immediately effective. When you recognize that your mind has gone to something unwholesome and you let it be and relax and smile and come back to something that is wholesome, you have let go of craving. You have gone from an unwholesome state to a wholesome state and sometimes a blink of an eye. And that's what is immediately effective. It really, really does work this way. And when I was in Thailand, they were talking about going into very high states of uh, different kinds of, they called them jhana, which they define as levels of concentration. And they say, if you want to practice with the Thai, it'll take about 15 years to be able to get into this deep state of concentration. And then I went to Sri Lanka and they started talking about that and they say, well, it'll take about 10 years for you to get to that level of concentration because of my going back to the original teachings and seeing what the Buddha said. When you come for a retreat, it might take three days to get to that same level they're talking about, if you follow directions the way that they're given. Okay, so I've been talking for a long time do you have any questions that you want to talk about? Ah, I love this stuff. You know, in Asia, I, I spent most of my time teaching in uh, Malaysia, and they are Chinese, and they're Chinese educated which means they never, ever come up with a question for a teacher, whether they understand it or not. But there's one section in the suttas, <laughs> you know what I'm going to do, and it says, and it's talking about karma and how karma works, and it says, if you want to be reborn stupid, then never ask any questions. If you want to be reborn intelligent, then ask a lot of questions. When I was with my, my teachers, I would drive them crazy because I was always asking questions. And one, one of my teachers said, in your next lifetime, if you don't get attain Nibbana now, you're going to be reborn smarter than Einstein because you asked so many questions. But an unwholesome thought is any thought that you take personally. This is me. This is mine. This is who I am. When in fact, you didn't ask it to come up, it's going to be there as long as it's going to be there, it's going to go away by itself. What you need to do is not keep your attention on it and identify with it. Let's say uh, you have a thought of a painful relationship that you're going through right now and your mind just goes, and you start thinking about it. Now, who brought that up? Whose thoughts are those? Whose feelings are those? Who doesn't like it? 
Who wants it to be different than it is? I do. I want it to be different than it is. I don't want this pain to be there. Now this is unwholesome because you're taking it personally. Now when you're practicing meditation, of course your mind is going to bit, get distracted. You're gonna have thoughts coming up if you have a very active day. You're gonna have an active mind when you sit down to meditate. Only natural. So you let it be. You recognize that your mind has become distracted. You let it be. You relax by not keeping your attention on it. And not, and not keep your attention on it. And then you bring up something wholesome. What's wholesome? Smile. Okay, how's your mind feel when you smile? Lighter. Not tight. And you bring that mind back to your object of meditation, which is wishing yourself happiness or wishing somebody else happiness. Now the nature of these kind of things is they don't go away right away. So you have to do it again. And then you have to do it again. But you have to understand that these kind of distractions are not bad. They're not something that makes you want to fight with it so you can control it. The truth is that when a hindrance arises, it is teaching you where your attachment is, where you're causing yourself pain. And every time that hindrance comes up again and again, it's, it's showing you the same lesson over and over again. As you relax into it, allow that to be there without keeping your attention on it. And then putting your attention on happiness and wishing other people happiness, that hindrance eventually starts to get weaker and weaker because you're not pushing against it anymore. You're not trying to fight it. And eventually that hindrance just doesn't have enough strength to arise anymore. When that happens, you will like it. I guarantee. You feel immediate sense of relief. Right after that, very strong joy arises. Now this kind of joy is called uplifting joy. It only happens through mental development. There's other kinds of joy that happen at other times. But this only happens through mental development. And you feel really light in your body. And you feel really light in your mind. And you start going, this is such a happy feeling. That's what I've been looking for. I want some of this to stay around. It's really good. But eventually that feeling will fade away a little bit and you will get a very, very strong sense of tranquility and you'll feel more comfortable in your mind and in your body than you've ever felt before. It's just, ah, really good. Is that long term or is that recent? Well, it, it's gonna, everything is impermanent. So it's going to last for a little while, but you see these hindrances when they come up and you deal with them this way by not getting involved with your thinking about and trying to control and that sort of thing. You're learning lessons about how you cause your own pain and how to let go of that pain. And you can take these lessons with you into your daily life. Now, everybody has a hindrance arise once in a while in their daily life. Anger comes up because something happened. You didn't like it. That's a hindrance. 
Now you get to work with that. Let it be. Relax and smile and come back and wish happiness. And that's how personality development occurs in Buddhism. The things that used to bother you really a lot eventually you'll get to a place where your mind has balance in it. And that doesn't mean that you're not going to have some role or some good stuff and bad stuff come up. You will. But instead of being in the roller coaster ride, I like this, I don't like that. I like this, I don't like that. You're going to start having more like waves happening. And you, you gain more and more balance in your mind as you go along but you have to learn the lessons of how you cause your mind upset before you can learn how to have balance so this is going to last for a little while and then it's going to go away and then another hindrance is going to come up and the hindrances are your teachers. They're showing you where your attachments are. If you don't take them personally, if you don't grab onto them and say, this is me, this is mine, this is who I am, if you start relaxing into it and letting it be and not being so caught up in the emotion of the moment, then you're opening yourself up to more and more equanimity, more and more balance in your life. And as a result, there's a lot more contentment. Now I looked up the word contentment. Contentment means happy. And it's not the giddy kind of happiness. This is just a deep happiness and you feel like you're learning something that you've never understood before. Buddhism is very much about how mind works. How? How does this process work? And as you go deeper and deeper into it, you become quite intelligent. I've, uh, I've had a lot of students, especially in Malaysia, where they, the, a lot of Christians would come and they would have discussion with Buddhists. And the Christians would always say, why does it seem that Buddhists are always, always so smart? So, because they became Buddhists. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not the real answer. The real answer is they're starting to see how everything really does work. And that makes you more and more intelligent. You don't get so caught up in emotional distraction and dislike and all of the things that cause your mind to fly away. You don't get so caught up in them anymore. And it gets more and more easy as you begin to keep your precepts without breaking them seeing the advantage of doing this, practicing your generosity. Now, a lot of people, they, they, they hear you got to practice giving. And they start thinking, well, this guy is trying to get into my, my pocket. He wants, me, he wants to have me give him some money. Monks don't need money. We do fine without it. How do you practice generosity? 
There's three ways you practice generosity. You practice generosity with your body, helping other people, with your speech, saying things that make other people happy and smile, and your mind. It's great fun to go into a restaurant or go into uh, a food store and be in line and there's a little baby right in front of you that's being bored and crying and just generally causing people havoc around them. And to start sending them loving and kind thoughts and all of a sudden they feel that and it, it's like they got woken up and they'll start looking at you and they'll start smiling at you. What a great way to practice your generosity. You're giving away kind thoughts and kind feelings to other people. And that's the first part of meditation. It's not just about sitting. This is part about, it's, it's living. It is real important. The more you can remember to send loving and kind thoughts to everybody else around you, the more you affect the world in a positive way. And right now, to be quite honest, this world needs a lot more positive energy than it has. So much fear, so much anxiety. Oh, what's going to happen? The world's going to end. People come and ask me whether I'm bothered by that. I said, no. Why am I bothered by that? It doesn't mean anything. I'm not going to worry about what's going to happen tomorrow. I want to be happy right now. And focus on that. Now, that's not suppressing anything. That's not pushing anything away. That is spending time where you help other people by wishing them happiness. Now, when the, the tsunami hit uh, Sri Lanka a few years ago, a lot of people on the internet were, were oh, they were really bemoaning the fact it's such a terrible thing. What can we do? We, we're we're so far away we can't help all we can do is be sad because he's, this tragedy happened to other people and Kema came to me and said what can we do for these other people I said what you do is you start getting on the internet and talking to all of these different groups and start sending loving and kind thoughts to all of those people that are suffering You think it doesn't do some good? I know it does. Everybody is looking for some of the same stuff. Everybody wants the same thing. I want to be loved. So practice your generosity and give it to them as much as you can remember during the day. So the more you can practice this, the easier it becomes, the more happy you become, and your happiness starts to go off and be get involved with other people, and they become happy. And you start affecting the world around you in a positive way. You're worrying, your being restless, your anxiety, your fear is not helping anybody, including yourself. That's just reaction. That's an action that you do over and over and over again. That you're causing yourself problem and you keep doing it 
because all of these different situations say, oh, you got to fear more. This Obamacare is going to take all your insurance away and then you're going to really suffer. Get away from me with that kind of stuff. You start wishing other people happiness. You go to hospitals and wish people happiness. You are affecting them in a very positive way. I've seen amazing miracles occur by going and visiting somebody in the hospital that's really sick and watching them change from being having extreme pain and dissatisfaction to smiling and being happy. That's a miracle. And you see, you can see those things happen all the time. So, any other question? Yes? by practicing what I just told you. It's going to come. There's going to be times when your mind is going to be, get caught. Come, come and practice with me for two weeks. I'm being serious. You'd be surprised at the personality difference because what I show you is what the Buddha said and then you get to see for yourself whether it's true or not. I got a question. Does this help college students? <laughs> it helps so much that it's unbelievable. Why? What happens when you have a test coming up and you know you really have to study hard because you haven't been hitting the books all that much and you're getting down to close to the time of the test and then you really start cramming and then you start worrying about oh I don't know whether I'm going to do good on this and all of a sudden you're not doing, you're not studying anymore, you're worrying about what the outcome is going to be. And then you have to go back and reread what you just got through reading because you didn't get all of it. What this practice does is it helps you to be very systematic and Um, efficient. Now, that worry, you know, you start thinking about something else and all of a sudden you're only half here and half over there. What is worry? First, it's a painful feeling that arose. Then there's, I don't like that feeling. And then there's, getting into and taking that feeling very personally and having your ideas and concepts about it. And then your habitual tendency about trying to control it and causing yourself a lot of suffering. When you see how that process works and you start letting it be and relaxing, then you're going to start staying on your object of meditation and it becomes fun. If you don't have fun with your studies, then it's time to find another way of studying so you do have fun with it. It's fun to learn new stuff. And the more fun you have, Learning it, the faster you learn, the better your grades become. The more efficient you become with what you're doing in the present moment. 
when you start to get serious about stuff, you're just putting roadblocks in your way. When you start to worry about, oh, I don't know whether I'm going to do this very well or not. What kind of fun is that? When you have fun, it's real easy to understand what you're doing while you're doing it. If you're not having fun in that class, think about another one. It's got to be fun. If it's not fun, why are you doing it? The whole thing with the Buddha was have an uplifted mind. What does that mean? Having a mind that has fun in life with everything. No worries, no anxieties. No depressions. Having an uplifted mind. Having fun. Learning new things. It really does work that way. Okay? Ghost? There is no such, no such a thing as reincarnation, first thing. There are people, I'll give you an example of what happened to me when I was in Asia for a while. I went to a graveyard and I spent the night at a graveyard. and there were energies around that were real that came into my mind while I was sleeping. If you don't want that sort of thing to occur, you start practicing loving kindness, wishing yourself happiness, wishing other be beings happy, and you put a bubble of loving kindness around you. And if there is a troubling energy, you put a bubble of loving kindness around it. And radiate that loving kindness. It will not bother you. Guaranteed. I had to learn that the hard way. I'm, I'm kind of a fanatic in some ways because I'll keep doing some of the same thing over and over again until I learn from it. And what I would do is, I, I spent about three weeks every night going to the cemetery for the whole night. And these beings would come into my mind. And some of them would try to scare me and some of them would try to do other things. And finally, when I started seeing that if I put loving kindness around me, then there was no more trouble and I had a good night's sleep. There is no more fear, there's no anxiety of these other beings that would cause problems. There is no more concepts You know, every thought you have is a concept. What is a concept? This is a table, right? Where is the table? Is it the top? Is it the legs? Is it the bracing? Where is the table? It's made up of a lot of little things that we put together and say this is a table. Now, to have these kind of concepts means that we have to have certain kinds of conditions to arise in order for that concept to arise. What the Buddha taught was how to get into the unconditioned mind or state. The unconditioned state, if there's no conditions, how can you talk about it when all you have 
is concepts and words to try to describe it. But there is extreme amounts of relief and the personality change becomes quite uh, noticeable. When you get to the first stage of this unconditioned state, you don't ever have any doubt as to whether this is the right path or not. No more doubt will ever arise in your mind. You won't believe that rites and rituals will lead to an unconditioned state. And you start seeing for yourself that everything is impersonal. It is part of an impersonal process. <clears throat> when you get to the third stage, you will not ever again have lust or hatred arise in your mind. Never again. Now that's some pretty radical personality change. And the last, the last stage of the uh, awakening is called becoming an arahat. You let go of wanting to be reborn in one realm or another. You let go of restlessness never coming up in your mind again or the sleepiness and dullness. You'll never have uh, any pride arising in your mind and you won't have any ignorance. Now, a mind that doesn't have any craving or ignorance, and ignorance is defined as being able to see and understand the four noble truths the way they actually are. If you don't have any craving or ignorance arise anymore, there is no suffering. And there's a lot, a lot of relief in that. Can that happen in this lifetime? Absolutely. Yes. I've been around a lot of monks that say there's no sense in even trying to get to this kind of state. It won't happen. Well, I'm here to tell you it can happen. It does happen for some people. It's pretty amazing to watch. Anyway, any other last question? No more questions? Let's share some merit then. This is something I always do after the end of a talk. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect a Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.